Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks, which I founded to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, compassionatecooks.com. Thank you to all of you who subscribe to the podcast. We've had some weird hiccups on iTunes in the last week or so, and it was only showing a few episodes from 2006 or something. And now my subscription numbers are all messed up. So see if you're still subscribed, if you use iTunes to subscribe and perhaps resubscribe if you got bumped off somehow. I apologize for that. And thank you for all of your emails and your stories. I'm often reluctant to read these emails on air because I don't want to sound self-congratulatory, but I feel so compelled to share them with you because they're just so incredible. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read a few emails that have a similar theme I just got kind of recently. They're from moms who found the podcast because they were doing research to make sure their newly vegetarian teenagers were getting the nutrients they need, etc. And so here are a few excerpts from a few recent emails. They're just absolutely incredible. Uh, this one's from Sherry in California. She wrote, I have to say that I have recently subscribed to your podcast and cannot get enough of it. Here it is, 3 a.m., and I'm still wanting to stay up and keep listening. I searched out information on the vegetarian lifestyle because my 15-year-old daughter has expressed her choice to be vegetarian. I, at first, was skeptical and a little hesitant because I wasn't sure how to feed her if she wasn't eating meat, and I also wasn't sure if this was just a passing phase or not. I will say that I have always taught her to stand by her convictions and live her truth with no apologies. She's made it abundantly clear that being vegetarian is not a passing fad, but a decision based on real principles of health and concern for animals. How can I say no to that? So I've set out on my quest to figure out how to feed my daughter a healthy variety of foods while respecting her choice to not consume animals. What I'm learning about myself along the way has been eye-opening, to say the least. And Sherry goes on to share her own incredible experience working across the street from a slaughterhouse that killed and quote-unquote processed chickens and how upsetting it was to see this every day. And she goes on, I guess what I'm trying to say is thank you. In my quest to seek out information to help with my daughter, I have come to the realization that I need to make the change also. So as of July 1st, 2007, I'm officially vegetarian along with my daughter. I chose a specific day so that we could have a little celebration. Meat has been a huge part of our family meals and holidays. But I'm off to bed now and glad I wrote to you and thanked you for your podcast. You have really great information and it has been a blessing. I yeah I feel the same way I feel blessed to have um, received that from you and to have been able to provide this information to you so thank you so much and this one's from dot I'm not sure where dot is she wrote uh, my 19 year old college sophomore daughter decided to become a vegetarian about a year ago then started listening to your show and became vegan she encouraged me to listen to you as I had been vegetarian for over 10 years but about two years ago had started eating meat per order from my doctor because I had become very anemic. After listening to a few of your shows I stopped eating meat. Not only have I learned a tremendous amount about healthy eating and getting all the vitamins and minerals one needs through vegetarian eating but I am now promoting vegetarianism to anyone who will listen. Please continue your research and dedication to educate people. The animals who are so innocent and completely dependent on us deserve it. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dot. That's I'm very grateful to receive your, your email. And then I have a, one last one from Colleen, another Colleen, who is one of the sponsors of this podcast. She wrote and said, among other things, my mom just became vegetarian after watching the Farm Sanctuary segment on your vegetarian cooking DVD. My mom always expressed sadness for the animals in the animal shelter who are put to sleep and was too disturbed by the notion to even go into an animal shelter, but she never made the connection that even though those animals die, they're treated with more respect and more humanely than farmed animals. Now that she has seen the devastating conditions of the farm animals thanks to your DVD, she's able to feel for all animals, not just cats and dogs. This is what I have the honor of waking up to every morning. It's incredible, incredible stuff. You guys all just move me and just inspire me and give me so much hope. 
Thank you so much. So please bask in the hope that exists in this world. It's there. It's real. You just have to believe in it and you have to focus on it. I believe we create what we focus on. So focus on the hope and I promise that's what you'll experience. Before we finish up this introduction, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Lori Feldman, who sent me the most beautiful email a couple months ago. It quite broke my heart. As you know, Lori, um, she wrote about her grief and guilt over the loss of her kitty cat and she wrote and contributed after hearing my podcast called what do vegetarians feed their dogs and cats and she shared her story with me I hope you're doing fantastically well, Lori, and I thank you again for your generous sponsorship and for being a voice for animals, for all animals, and for loving Ari, your kitty, and taking care of him as, as best as you are able. If you'd like to send me an email, you can do so at podcast at compassionatecooks.com. And if you do find my MySpace page, by the way, I do get comments from you on my MySpace page. I think it's just Compassionate Cook um, at you know MySpace. You just search for Compassionate Cook. But some of you write to me via MySpace. It's a little difficult for me to respond via MySpace. So if you do find me there, um, you know, just send me an email. It's just a lot easier for me to respond. So those of you who have written to me and I haven't responded, it's just because it's um, it's more difficult for me to get there and do that, but I will. I promise. So today I want to talk about barbecues and burgers and backyard bites. That's the name of the theme of one of my regular cooking classes. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm pretty fond of alliteration, barbecues, burgers, and backyard bites. So let's talk. I'm going to talk about being a vegetarian at non-vegetarian barbecues. Tell you a little story about when I was on the meat network, I'm sorry, I mean the food network, and then share some very specific ideas about what to serve at a barbecue, ideas for the grill, some recipes, etc. Regarding being a vegetarian at a non-vegetarian barbecue, this is probably not the most helpful piece of advice, but I can only tell you the truth about how I cope at non-vegetarian barbecues. So here it is. I don't. I don't cope because I don't go. I realize that it's not always possible to avoid such events and that the point as vegans is not to isolate ourselves in this crazy non-vegan world, but barbecues are really tough for me. And though I know there are times when we have to eat across from someone who's munching on someone's legs or backside or torso or eyeballs or whatever we're eating these days, um, I think it's a little easier to avoid looking. You know, it's like possible to not look at what they're putting on their fork or in their mouth, but barbecues are totally different. First, there's the smell. Unfortunately, once summer begins, it's not like I can avoid barbecues completely anyway, because if I'm in my backyard on any given weekend and sometimes during the week, someone's grilling the bodies of animals. I can't escape the smell of burning flesh. I can't escape the smoke that rises from that burnt flesh. It's horrible and it's offensive. Even if I come inside my house because of the position of my neighbor's grill on their patio, I have to close all the windows or the smell just wafts into my kitchen and living room and dining room. It's just not pleasant. Ironically, I was just talking to that particular neighbor about another neighbor. We were not gossiping. We had a context to our conversation, but we were talking about how this one neighbor tends to play music really loudly outside in the yard. And my neighbor said, you know, when I'm outside, I just want to enjoy my yard. I just want to enjoy the quiet of my own yard. Not everyone wants to hear someone else's music. And I was oh so tempted to make the same point about the smells I have to endure from their yard. I mean, what's the difference? There's no difference. Interestingly, on that note, I don't know if you've read anything about what's happening in some places in India, particularly in Mumbai, where there is a growing trend for neighborhood societies to uphold strict vegetarian only housing policies. People who create these communities and enforce this rule want to be surrounded by like minded people and smell is one of the reasons they appreciate living in vegetarian only housing where there's no meat anywhere, even in the local, not even in the local restaurants for miles. I read one article where someone on the other side of the issue was complaining. He said, it's just not fair. It's a monopoly by vegetarians. If you step out to eat, there's nothing for miles because everything around is vegetarian. Yeah, nothing around for miles because of the vegetarian monopoly. <laughs> so that just cracked me up. And the issue is creating animosity, of course, but it's a really interesting issue. My husband and I were gardening in our front yard the other day, and we packed up early because my neighbor across the street started grilling animals, and it was just offensive. So I think this whole thing is a really interesting issue. 
Anyway, that's one of the reasons I don't go to meat-centered barbecues. You can't escape the smell. You can't escape seeing the buckets of animal thighs, breasts, backs, butts, wings, you know, whatever they're cooking up. And that's all you see. It's like a horror movie. Now, I've said this a million times, but I'll say it again. I grew up eating this stuff. I grew up with a veil in front of my eyes that enabled me to grab the leg of an animal detached from her body, of course, and sink my teeth into it. It wasn't until the veil was lifted that I saw and now see things differently. So I say this is offensive to me that it looks like a horror movie because it is. And if you're listening to this and are offended by my use of these words, I can assure you I'm not saying anything that isn't true. I'm calling them what they are. These are the body parts of animals. So there's that. There's not being able to avoid looking at these cut up animal parts anyway and then there's just how surreal it all is everyone focused on those body parts everyone ooing and eyeing over the burned flesh ooing and eyeing over those bodies just isn't my idea of a good time i guess thanksgiving would be the other holiday where a dead animal is the center of the celebration so of course we host every year and 15 of our good friends have the most lovely dinner with no dead bird i don't know the last time i ate thanksgiving dinner with a dead turkey and I don't see it ever happening. There's I there's no way I would actually be at a Thanksgiving dinner with a dead turkey. So it's the same with the barbecues. So I'm sorry if my advice is to like, I don't go to the barbecues. Anyway, so speaking of barbecues, I want to tell you a story about the Food Network and a certain vegan cooking instructor. That's me. A few years ago, the producers of a Food Network show called Barbecue with Bobby Flay wanted to film a vegetarian segment for the show. Whatever they had originally planned to shoot in the San Francisco area had fallen through, so one way or another, they got in touch with me and asked if I would be interested in having them film a vegetarian barbecue that we would host in our backyard. I said, of course, no problem. I think they knew off the bat that it was vegan, too. So I said yes, and then I had two days to put this thing together. It was a last-minute last minute plan. I contacted a bunch of friends and told them they had to come to this emergency barbecue <laughs> at my house that Friday and everybody came through. We had about 15 people planning on coming with vegan goodies in hand. In the meantime, I prepared the menu for the grill, which included marinated eggplant, portobello mushrooms, polenta, corn on the cob, a skewers, you know, kebabs with peppers and tomatoes and squash and tofu, and even fruit which we which we grilled up. The other thing we had to do was borrow a grill. We had some like rinky dink little charcoal grill thingy, but our neighbors, the same ones I was just talking about, loaned us their fancy schmancy gas grill. So a crew of five showed up that Friday morning and they were fantastic. Before we filmed the actual barbecue, first they wanted footage of us shopping for the ingredients. Now, of course, we had already bought all the food. So this was kind of a mock shopping experience, which was great. We went to our little grocery farmer joe's and the last shot the crew set up was us driving our prius out of the parking lot and they made a point to zoom in on our bumper sticker which says be kind to animals don't eat them so i was pretty excited about that and that shot did make it into the final cut so we started filming in the backyard and they set up some contrived shots of me watering our organic and vegan vegetable garden and of David using a chimney to light the charcoal grill. A chimney allows you to avoid using the toxic lighter fluid and an interview with me, etc. We actually had to go back to the store. Someone ran to the store because the director really wanted us to use some things that would be less familiar to people watching, things like seitan and tempeh, but things that would actually look like meat. And of course, we did have veggie hot dogs and, and burgers as well. And the crew was fantastic. We had a really great time with them. They were here all day, I mean, from the morning until night. And it turned out my poor friends, who all had to wait like several hours before we finally ate, I mean, there was a lot of standing around for them because most of this was just me, you know, preparing, cooking, talking, being interviewed. And um, and the production company really don't, I don't think they ever shot any of the salads except when we were plating the food. So really they could have eaten the whole time, but they were like starving all day. It was really sad. <laughs> so cut to the airing of the actual show. Now I've said before, we don't have TV, we don't have cable. So we couldn't watch it when it first aired. I think it was summer 2004. I think it was summer of 2004. So a friend taped it and brought it over the next day. Now, 
it's always risky doing something like this, right? Because you never know how they're going to edit it. So even if they get fabulous shots and footage, which they did, I mean, it was fantastic when we shot it. You never know how it's going to be when they edit it. But I promise you, it was just absolutely gorgeous. They did a beautiful job uh, depicting us as, you know, normal people just hanging out, having a, a vegan barbecue. So it was really, really awesome. But you were waiting for the butt, weren't you? I mean, there is a catch, right? The story wouldn't be that interesting if I ended there. So here's the catch. So apparently in this show called Barbecue with Bobby Flay, they have these sub episodes called Crazy Cues, right? Crazy Cues, crazy, crazy cues, like barbecue, crazy cues. So even though they edited our segment beautifully, it was couched in a show called Crazy Cues. And I couldn't even watch the other segment, but the other segments in that particular episode um, was there was an alien barbecue. Yeah, don't ask. It was filmed in Roswell, New Mexico or something. And there was a gas station barbecue, which was disgusting. It was just these huge pieces of animals on this disgusting grill at a gas station. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, then there was this solar barbecue guy. And don't get me wrong, I'm all about solar, but it was pathetic watching this guy run around his yard with a huge piece of meat in this contraption as he chased the sun trying to get this thing to cook. So that's the story. So great episode on its own, but they couched us under freaks, under crazies. And watching it was like playing that children's game. Remember that Highlights magazine for children, the game, which of these don't belong? I mean, you had like these kind of, you know, just weird, kind of, you know, alien barbecue. Yeah. I mean, people are going to think that's great, weird. Right. And then you had like a bunch of people hanging out in the backyard eating really good food, but it was crazy because we were eating vegetables. That's just like crazy. And we wonder why vegetarianism isn't more popular. We wonder why more people don't have positive perceptions of being vegetarian. It's not the fault of the food. I can assure you a much larger game is being played. You know, but lots of great stuff came out of the Food Network shoot. Two of the guys from the crew were really impressed with our work, and they volunteered to be part of our cooking DVD shoot, which we were filming a couple weeks later. One guy lived here in Berkeley and became our assistant director, and the other, who'd been doing Food Network shows for years, flew up from L.A. for the weekend at his own expense and became our director of photography. And even though the DVD would have been really beautiful without their help, having their experience and their expertise and their skills just increased the production value immensely. And you can see for yourself if you buy the DVD. It's $5 off at CompassionateCooks.com. So ultimately, it was a really great experience, and one of them became a friend. So there you have it. The Meat Network, I mean the Food Network, had their chance to showcase vegetarian food without making it seem freaky. And, well, there you have it. So moving on. On. I'm really thrilled to announce that I'm now writing for a fantastic website called greenoptions.com. That's www.greenoptions.com. And my first article for them was on vegan barbecues. You can read this whole thing on their website. My name should be listed in the, the, the names of writers. If it's not yet, I know they're getting on that, but you can find it, you know, search for vegan barbecue or something. But I want to offer some specific suggestions for what to make for a vegan barbecue. And I'd like to share some of what I wrote in the piece for Green Options. So I said, you know, in my work as a vegan educator, advocate, and cooking instructor, one of my goals is to take vegan food out of the box. There tends to be a notion that vegan food exists in a food group separate from normal food or reserved only for those who label themselves vegan. But the fact is that even non-vegans eat vegan food every day. They just don't call it vegan. Plant-based cuisine is simply made up of all the foods that we already love and already eat. Vegetables, fruits, legumes, grains, nuts, beans, seeds, mushrooms, herbs, and spices. When we recognize that vegan food is already part of our meals, we take the mystery out of the label. Plant foods contain all the flavors, all the textures and colors that satisfy our palates and our senses. In fact, it's flavor, texture, and familiarity we crave whenever we eat. And all of these elements are found in the rich array of plant foods available to us. The holy triumvirate of meat, dairy, and eggs has become so dominant in our daily diets that they've replaced what was once the foundation of the human diet. 
plant foods. Even when we do eat vegetables, we drown them in fat-laden cheeses, in oily butters, in heavy cream sauces, forgetting that the vegetables themselves contain all the flavor we crave. I am always surprised when people declare that vegan food is bland and boring. I remind them that the herbs and spices we flavor our food with are all plant-based. They're all Considering the fact that we're the only animal who has to cook and flavor meat before we eat it, it's not surprising that the things with which we typically serve our hamburgers, our hot dogs, and steaks are plant-based. Ketchup, mustard, relish, sauerkraut, pickles, tomatoes, lettuce, barbecue sauce, Worcestershire sauce, Tabasco sauce, chili sauce, horseradish, liquid smoke, vinegars, lime and lemon juices, other citrus juices, and of course, salt and pepper. You also have your capers, wasabi, tahini, soy sauce, chutneys, and a variety of other condiments to provide flavor, to provide some heat and texture. We don't flavor our meat with meat. I mean, I suppose some people do, but that's just wrong. We flavor our meat with plant foods. Plant foods contain the flavor, not meat. A backyard barbecue is the perfect occasion to showcase delicious, nutritious, animal-free foods that will satisfy bellies and arouse taste buds. And by serving only plant foods, you're not only doing animals a favor, you're doing yourself a favor. Every summer, I'm so dismayed by the safety tips you've seen these about grilling meat that show up all over the place. They give people the false impression that they can actually prevent the carcinogenic, the cancer-causing compounds called heterocyclic amines from forming when they cook meat, including chicken, beef, pork, and fish at high temperatures. You've heard of this, right? Let me repeat that. Cancer-causing compounds are inevitably created when you cook meat at high temperatures, whether you're grilling or pan frying. So you read these safety tips that make it seem as if you're in control, as if you can actually do something about it. The fact is, there is no magic formula that people can follow to ensure that these compounds don't form. They form. It's just inevitable. But when you get these safety tips, it's almost like they don't know what they're talking about. The experts don't really know the, 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 the safe levels. So it's like, do you want a little cancer or do you want a lot of cancer? They don't know. The safest thing to do is to not eat it. And there's evidence, by the way, that there are higher amounts of heterocyclic amines in chicken meat. So once again, undermining the claim that chicken meat is somehow health food. You undercook your meat and you risk consuming dangerous foodborne pathogens. Heat your meat and you risk cancer. What happens when you cook vegetables? They get hot. These cancer-causing substances are not present. They do not form when plant foods, including the vegetarian burgers and vegetarian hot dogs, are cooked, period. And of course, in terms of nutrition, what you're also getting when you make plant foods the foundation of your diet is fiber and antioxidants, all of which are completely absent in animal products and have been shown to help prevent cancer. Now, I realize that cancer may not be 100% preventable, but I, for one, prefer doing what I can to prevent it and not taking unnecessary risks when the risks are real and unavoidable, especially in this particular case. So what are some fabulous foods to feature on the grill? That alliteration was not on purpose, by the way. Some fabulous foods to feature on the grill. Eggplant slices seasoned with a teriyaki marinade. You can either buy a marinade from the store, you can make your own. I do this on the Food Network, actually. I just watched the segment again. Uh, you can make it with tamari, soy sauce, white wine, a little sesame oil, some light brown sugar, some rice vinegar or white wine vinegar, and, a, and some fresh garlic and ginger. The large globe or Italian eggplants work best for this, but you can also use the longer Asian eggplants. Portobello mushrooms, marinated in a teriyaki sauce or any kind of sauce. I mean, anything, again, that you can get from the store. Marinate for like a half hour and then add them to the grill. You'll want to lightly brush the grill with some oil first. You can make beautiful skewers of bell peppers, red onions, summer squash, and again, tofu. And again, lightly oil the grill and then just brush on your marinade while they cook. It doesn't take long. Corn on the cob grills really beautifully. You can just grill them right in their husks. This method kind of steams the corn while giving it a slight smokiness that brings out the corn flavor. And all you need to do 
is peel away the outermost layers of the husk. If the ears have many layers of husk on them, just peel off the first few, leaving a few layers for protection, but allowing the kernels to kind of see through a bit. Grill the corn on a hot grill, turning often until the first layer of husk is completely charred. Now, depending on your fire, this could take anywhere from five to 10 minutes. It's just so delicious. And you can add some little salt, a little pepper, and some earth balance. This is the best non-dairy butter out there. This is not smart balance. That's different. This is earth balance. And everything you do with dairy butter, you can do with earth balance. Bake, spread, whatever, everything. It's just amazing stuff. Polenta squares are perfect for the grill. There's absolutely nothing like grilled polenta. It's just fantastic. And polenta is so easy to make. I make it frequently, even if I don't grill it. You can eat it in so many ways. Um, just boil three cups of water. Then slowly add the cornmeal. You want coarse cornmeal and stir it all the while while you add the cornmeal to the boiling water. It'll start cooking right away. So just keep stirring over low heat. And then you can add a half a cup of non-dairy milk, some salt, some sun-dried tomatoes chopped up finely, um, some already sauteed garlic and some finely chopped red onion, again, already sauteed, and even some nutritional yeast. And you stir for about 10 minutes and then you remove remove it from the heat and you pour it into a 9 by 12 dish and you let it set in the fridge. Now it doesn't take long to set, but just give it an hour to, to just be safe. And when you're ready to grill it, cut the polenta into squares, brush with a little olive oil so they don't stick to the grate and grill it up. Absolutely delicious. And you can top the polenta and other vegetables. You can also do this with your with the skewers that you make or or, or tofu that you grill. Um, so you can make a dairy free pesto, which is again super easy to make. Remember the life after cheese episode in which I talked about how there are many dishes that are wonderful if you remove the cheese, but you don't necessarily have to replace with a non dairy cheese. Pesto is an example of that. So you can just make pesto by adding to a food processor a couple bunches of fresh basil, a few cloves of garlic half a cup or so of pine nuts or walnuts and you puree them all and scrape down the sides if necessary drizzle in a small amount of olive oil and puree until thoroughly combined and smooth and you can also add some sun-dried tomatoes for a sun-dried tomato pesto if you want an oil-free pesto I've tried it with a tablespoon of white miso instead of the oil, and that worked really well. So anyway, pesto is a fabulous flavoring for many, many vegetables, including this fantastic grilled polenta. I mentioned tempeh before, and you should know by now that I love tempeh. And if you don't know what it is, check out the episode called Five Favorite Foods. Again, there's that alliteration. So sorry. <laughs> anyway, just cut the tempeh into slices, steam it for five or 10 minutes, and then just marinate it in a barbecue sauce for a half hour or so, and then just grill it up. It's just delicious. So those are some examples of foods to grill. Oh, and don't forget the fruit. Grilled fruit is amazing. When you grill fruit, you're decreasing the water and increasing the sugar, essentially caramelizing it. So you really concentrate the flavor and the process is really simple. Hard fruits like apples and pears, um, pineapples work really well because they hold their shape and texture while cooking. Softer fruits like peaches, nectarines, plums, mangoes, figs um, will become soft and mushy if overcooked. So just be more attentive to those kinds of fruits, but they're still fantastic to grill. You just pick a firm fruit, a fresh, uh, fresh, firm fruit that's just short of being perfectly ripe. And uh, with many of these fruits, you can just cut them in half. You can cut them into slices and then just remove the seeds and core them. And then typically with most fruits, you can also leave the peels on. Once you've cut the fruit, soak the fruit in water that minimizes the amount of liquid inside the fruit so it stays juicy on the grill. So use an, And use enough cold water to completely cover the fruit. And then just add like a teaspoon of lemon juice per one cup of water to preserve the color. And let the fruit soak in the lemon water for 20 to 30 minutes. And then to keep the fruit from sticking to the grill, again, lightly spray them with a canola oil. You don't want a strong tasting oil like olive. Or you can just brush them with melted non-dairy butter like the earth balance and then grill them up fantastic of course there's a huge array of summer salads that can be made from beans or pasta potatoes tofu tempeh or grains the options are endless and again you can check out some free recipes on my website and then there's also other recipes recipe packets you can buy at compassionatecooks.com and then some are on the green options website from that article as well and just here are some general ideas you can toss pasta, whether it's penne pasta or frusilli pasta, uh, with chopped raw vegetables like bell peppers, carrots, celery, uh, lightly toasted pine nuts, 
fresh basil or other fresh herbs and balsamic vinegar. You just toss it and you get a great salad and try different balsamic vinegars. There's so many different flavors out there. Check a specialty store in your area or your local farmer's market. We have a wonderful balsamic vinegar stand at our farmer's market. And I have like a black cherry balsamic vinegar. I love white balsamic vinegar. If you've never tried that, I have fig vinegar. There's so many different kinds. Vinegar is definitely one of those things to keep in your cupboard to add instant flavor to things. Another salad that you can make really simply is just a spinach salad. Um, spinach leaves, fresh raspberries, sunflower seeds, and Brazil or macadamia nuts some mandarin oranges, uh, the slices, you know, and then um, toss with just seasoned rice vinegar just before serving. Just delicious. And then uh, focaccia bread, you can um, spread focaccia bread with the dairy-free pesto again and add grilled vegetables to the focaccia like grilled eggplant, grilled zucchini, squash, thinly sliced tofu, roasted red peppers, fresh tomatoes, and basil. And then you just drizzle that with some balsamic vinegar. It's delicious. So again, uh, check out greenoptions.com for my favorite Thai slaw. And if there's the recipe is on there. And then, of course, you can't forget dessert. I have two recipes up on Green Options. My no-bake strawberry pie, which is absolutely fantastic. It's so perfect for the summertime when strawberries are at their most ripe and most sweet. And then the crust I use is just so easy. It's just dates and pecans or almonds. You can use almonds too. And then also I have the chocolate cake recipe up there. And you can purchase again more dessert recipes at compassionatecooks.com. And of course, from my new cookbook, which you can pre-order online at Amazon and other places. It's called The Joy of Vegan Baking, Compassionate Cooks, Traditional Treats and Sinful Sweets. And you can check that out online. So even though I draw the line at barbecues. It doesn't mean you have to or, or want to. And I realize there are times you find yourself in meat-based barbecues or you can't get out of an invitation or you want to go to see friends or family. And so there are just a few things you can do to make sure you enjoy the food. The first suggestion is to bring food. All right. But do make enough for everybody because inevitably everyone will want to eat your fabulous food. It never fails. If there is any public activity involving the food of a vegan and a meat eater, the vegan food gets gobbled up by everybody, vegans and non-vegans alike. So make sure you bring enough for everybody, including yourself. Um, and then, you know, it, be in touch with the host. Maybe you're good friends with the host and, and you know that they're already planning on providing vegetarian food for the grill. You know, so that's a possibility. Or you can bring your own, like, you know, hot dogs or hamburgers, vegetarian hot dogs or veggie burgers, that kind of thing. So just be prepared. That just helps a lot when you're going to non-vegetarian events, even events other than barbecues. When we filmed our segment for the Food Network, after they had all the shots they needed for the preparation and the cooking of the food, we finally got to eat. And the director wanted some footage of our friends enjoying the food. And he asked everyone the same question, do you miss the meat? And each of our friends uh, answered beautifully and eloquently. But the last person who answered absolutely stole the show. They asked my husband, David, if he missed the meat. And David gave the most lovely, authentic, unrehearsed answer. And he said something like, a vegan barbecue couldn't be more meaningful and enjoyable. The flavors are outstanding. The vegetables, the marinades, the friends. I mean, that's what the barbecue is really all about, spending time with the people you love. The food is just an excuse to get together. Mm -hmm. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening.